What did you think about Butch Jones referring to there's a negative fan base out there, subtle shot at Tennessee after he had his little cry fest on the sideline. And um, wow, what's wrong with that dude? Yeah, probably a number of things at this point. Um, he's not winning a lot. He's made a lot of money. And that should, I think, help a lot of people in stressful work environments feel a little bit better. But I'm not sure that it is. There is a bit of a a Spider-Man meme here because he's not wrong in that the Tennessee fan base continues to follow and watch and uh, make fun of, in, in this case, what's going on with Butch Jones. He also is well aware that that is happening on social media. So it's kind of like the two sides can't quit each other. But the problem for Butch Jones is he is losing a lot. And that's, I'll be honest, I thought he, was, he would go there and do well enough because coaches have gone to Arkansas State, had had a lot of success, and then jumped to or back to a Power 5 position. That just has not worked out. That was an embarrassing performance. I know it's Oklahoma, but 73 to nothing. It uh, goes without saying how bad that is. So, yeah, that, but n- neither neither side can quit each other. M- message boards, Twitter threads are always filled with Butch Jones chatter with what's going on. Travis says, I welcome every single one of Butch's failures. Uh, he can go kick rocks. Uh, Caleb knows he's, history. He's not snapping and clearing. I think it is safe to say that. <laughs> hey, remember, uh, what was the saying? It wasn't, it was like a pound the rock saying that he had it at Fred Tennessee. Fred? Brick by brick. Well, he had the same yeah. thing. If you remember in Cincinnati, it was pull the rope. So does he have a saying at Arkansas State at this point? Let's get back up and try again. <laughs> get back up and try again. Just give it your best. Look, guys, the only thing that Tennessee's missing with Butch Jones this year, Josh, as you know, they wouldn't have to play their backups against Austin Peay because the backups could just get the mental reps. You know, oh, every, every – yes, Yeah, leadership every, reps. Leadership rep. That's right. Leadership rep. Mm-hmm. But if you don't get it, it doesn't matter if you don't get an actual rep, you still get a leadership rep by not playing. <laughs> what about the guy that put his arm around him? Is that guy a champion of life as he's on the sidelines getting beat 73 to zero? Well, that player, I don't, I don't know anything about him specifically, but I could imagine that if he were to fall on a helmet, he would be the kind that it would not keep from being able to pick himself back up and, and succeeding into the future. Can we do we want to play true. this? Sorry, Josh. Do we want to play this clip real quick? Because this is pretty fantastic. Here, let's just pull this up here. Uh, there's the butcher um with the eight dollar haircut that might just be six dollars because he's losing some of it. Uh, if you're not on if you're on an audio platform, we're, we're looking at this press conference. So go ahead and fire this off. Well, if you look at uh, social media or I don't check that at all. I mean, I, I would, I would hope there would be people that would be upset. I mean, they, mean, they have passion, but also I know that a lot of that is from another fan base. So I don't pay much attention to that. Um, That's the only part that matters. Yes, we would like to thank Aquaman for providing that audio. Um. <laughs> I, I don't pay, I don't pay much attention to that, but it's from another fan base, which means you pay attention to it. Right, Josh, how much uh, – we got cliche by cliche and tier by tier on the message board. Josh, how much do you think of his downfall at Tennessee was because he cared what everybody thought too much? I mean, who you know, who cares? I, we've seen Sean Payton talk about Russell Wilson. You're not trying to be a politician. Just go out there and play or win football games. Yeah, I think Butch Jones changed during his time at Tennessee. I think he got to Tennessee when it was the honeymoon phase and did well in recruiting, and a lot of people bought in and – really did back up the brick by brick slogan fans were all in on that for the first couple of years but at some point the results had to follow and they didn't get to where fans expected where butch jones thought they would they fell short of the big picture goals of winning the east and winning winning sec titles and all that and the pressure started to build and i think it really affected butch jones then there are other layers uh managing big time players that you were recruiting to tennessee there's a skill to that the strength coach changed. That was mishandled. But Butch Jones was too thin-skinned at Tennessee and worried about things that he shouldn't have been worrying about. He should have been spending more time on his job and worrying less about what was being said on the outside. The outside noise affected him at Tennessee, and 
It probably still is to this point. There, there's not as much coverage, of course, at Arkansas State as there is at Tennessee, but uh, the results have been even worse, and that's affecting him too. It is amazing to me how, how you would allow yourself to care about stuff. And I don't typically make fun of people when they're down, but he was a sociopath that threatened the media behind closed doors to kind of control the narrative, as somebody referenced on the message board. And that's fact. I mean, he had guys that got out of the media business partly because – of that uh, well, let me ask you guys and Caleb knows history like nobody's business when it comes to Tennessee uh, he's the worst coach in Tennessee football other than blank hmm. I think they're Dooley's <laughs> the worst oh you think Dooley's worse than the butcher yeah Butch just won so much more than Derek Dooley yeah. like what did like, give me one good thing Derek Dooley did I Nothing. Actually, he, lo- I- he, he lost the streak against Kentucky he thought that in 2012, there was no need to sign an offensive lineman as a coach in the SEC. That's so, fair. no, I think Derek Dooley's the worst. And by the way, still defends that decision. In hindsight, Derek Dooley has still said, yeah, but people forget that we had this great offensive line that was coming back. And my response would be, did you forget that they don't stay forever, that they go pro? So, uh, yeah, I think Derek Dooley's the worst. His record is abysmal. Uh, I thought he was a total fraud when he was the head coach, and it, and he left Tennessee in an awful position. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. He, he, because he had a Southern accent, he acted like he was one of the people, when the truth is that uh, the way he really acted is like he was above everybody else. Not true at all. I'm actually going to push back a little bit on Josh on this. Oh, Caleb because... loves Derek Dooley. No, I do not love Derek Dooley. You are right. Derek Dooley was the – he's the most condescending coach ever in, in the media. I've never seen a more condescending head coach in interviews in the media. I mean, he always talked like he was smarter than you, and it was annoying because he wasn't showing. But I do think Derek Dooley – the one thing I give him that I don't give Butch Jones, Derek Dooley took over Tennessee in a much worse situation than Butch Jones took over Tennessee. I mean, it's not even comparable. What no, I don't agree with that at all. You don't agree with that at all? The, no. the whole post-Kiffin NCAA investigation that Derek Dooley inherited in 2010? Yeah, I don't I don't think that affected them much at all. They still recruited just fine. I think the roster uh, – remember when Butch Jones inherited the program at Tennessee as well, they were at that point a half decade removed from any kind of success. Derek Dooley inherited the program two years after they played in the SEC title. Uh, he also had – I think he had more – talent to work with uh neither inherited an ideal situation uh i'm not saying that uh about either but uh to say that it's not close i think is just is crazy uh that that class that lane left in terms of the early enrollees was uh was it included juan james it included tyler bray who had nfl talent i think Derek dooley was awful for tyler bray because there was no leadership from the head coach and tyler at that time as a 18 year old coming in from high school needed to mature, Derek Dooley was the worst coach for him. So I think there was a ton for Butch Jones to have to clean up when he took over the perception around Tennessee's program was really bad. Here's part of the problem with that is the perception was bad. And I think that Butch Jones fell into that trap too, guys. I think he he told a reporter afterwards when Tennessee struggled uh, and he was at Alabama at one point. He he told a reporter, he said, you know, I had uh, you guys talking to the reporter at nine wins. That's pretty good. And uh, what was wrong with that? And now you're struggling. I think that was part of the problem. And Tennessee's fan base got caught up in that. Uh, both you guys, Josh, if you want to jump in, and Caleb, I think Tennessee's fan base wondered if they could ever be a championship contending team. And Josh Heupel has remarkably changed that in just a couple of years. Yeah, Hypo, Hypo's changed it quickly. Um, so, but when remember when when Butch signed that 14 class with all the in-state guys, I think the expectation at the time was, hey, we are we are on our way back and we'll be there pretty soon. And then the 15 class that included so many highly touted guys like Khalil McKenzie, that was stacking top five to top 10 classes in back-to-back years. And at that point, Josh Dobbs had taken over and there was a belief that, okay, he's ready to take the next step. And I I think fans still believe the program was close to a championship level. Heupel, I think, inherited the spot where it was it had the most people saying, man, can can we really get back there? Because it had been more than a decade at that point since Tennessee had competed for an SEC title. 
and then George is in the position that it's in. So I think with each coach, there was pretty quick buy-in. I mean, fa- the, the craziest thing to me about the Derek Dooley era, and there was a long list of crazy things, but this is number one for me, is that remember Eric Berry had beef with Derek Dooley. And a lot of people sided with Derek Dooley <laughs> over Eric Berry, who is – top five legend in my opinion in Tennessee football at least in the the modern history of Tennessee football and at the time because of the coach worship with Derek Dooley a lot of people said Eric's in the wrong here and he was not they were what lying the about beef? Eric Berry help, help that was one of my help it help was insane the, what was the beef well it had to do with Art Evans and I'm not I'm not saying that Eric's opinion was was totally on board uh, with reality in terms of art and his performance at Tennessee. But there there was an issue with Art Evans and Derek Dooley, and Eric went public with it. And Tennessee, through a number of people, put out this flat-out lie that they had tried to get in touch with Eric, and he and he was uh, non-communicative with them. It's like, uh, there are a number of ways to get in touch with Eric Berry, who plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. The media could get in touch with him, but they just flat-out lied. And that came that all came from Derek Dooley. Remember, there was the issue with a number of former players and he had the you, you, I think you asked one of the questions of the follow-up Dave where Derek Dooley was talking about uh former players having an issue coming to the facility or getting to practice and he had this policy you had to call ahead and you had to get on a list and he was like I call my brother how difficult is it boom it's like well was hey moron cool. what if nobody answers what if nobody calls back so uh it was just it was an embarrassing ride for three years and fans pretty quickly after that figured out wait a minute you know, that Kentucky loss caused a lot of people to say yeah, I don't know. And when all the assistant coaches decided to jump ship and get away, uh, that was another sign that, it, yep, this probably didn't have too much time. But in that first year and a half, uh, it was it was an, at times shameful the amount of backing that Dooley had versus people that had actually done good things for Tennessee. Yeah, I got lambasted for that. And the reason I asked that question, which led to that, was because five players called me the day before and said they couldn't get into practice. And I know this is a, a week to celebrate Condridge Holloway, but he was put in charge of handling dozens of phone calls from former players that want to go to practice. He didn't have time for that. Yeah, it was just it was stupid by Derek Dooley. He uh, he didn't know what he was doing, and he was trying to implement something that was unnecessary, and he had it poorly organized in the process. So it was, it, was the, it was one of the many things he worried about. Like when we talk about Butch Jones worrying about things that didn't matter, and he did, and that was one of his issues. I mean, the, the stories of Derek Dooley, how much he was concerned about his office and the view of it when they were redoing uh, some of the facility uh, stuff there. He was worried about things that he shouldn't care about at all. But that, again, is why he had the embarrassing results that he did. Yeah, and at the bottom of all, but the bottom line is, I know you guys debated a little bit who took over the tougher job. At at the very top, there was not a Don Day Plowman. So at the very top, there was not. Yeah, a they didn't. They didn't have the right leadership in place yeah. for the the head coaches who were. I mean, Derek Dooley was definitely in over his head. He he had just gone four and eight at Louisiana Tech, and all of a sudden he's at the head coach at Tennessee. So uh, to Caleb's point about inheriting the position that he did. Derek Dooley was so poorly equipped to take on that challenge. Butch Jones at least had you know, some kind of idea of what it was going to take. He just he couldn't he couldn't get there. He his plan wasn't all that bad. He recruited a, a high level, and uh, while we mock some of the things that he said early on, again, a lot of people bought into it. If he had had the results that he hoped to have and fans hoped to have, then all that stuff is celebrated today. But he became more frustrating for fans. The press conferences became a turnoff. He, uh, like, like the fell in a helmet thing, that goes into one of the topics today, I believe, just flat out lying at his press conference. And everybody knew that it was a lie, but he did it because of who knows what kind of concept he had in his in his mind. And I've heard that the players behind the scenes even made fun of him. Like, come on, that's the best you could come up with. So, uh, yeah, it's just, there. We, you could do a book on on just the, the press conference and public image of the head coaches from you know, Kiffin's kind of a separate uh, separate story. That'd be like the forward maybe to the book. But then you have the Dooley, who remember remember at his opening press conference, Dave. You and I looked at each other like this isn't going to work out, right? I think we just maybe disagreed <laughs> we, on how long it would take we, for it to not work out. We actually said he, he said he he said you're not going to because Kiffin had all had all these one liners and all this media attention, and Dooley said you're not going to get that from me. And then he goes and does a a shower press conference and a where's Rommel line and talking yeah, about bamboo about and then you know the the butch era speaks for itself 
And then Jeremy Pruitt, who never could figure out how to, how to put the gator on his head. So uh, it's it's been an amazing run that now has Tennessee in the place where it should have been all along with a guy who knows what he's doing and Josh Heupel. I don't know if he's going to win championships, but he's he has a much better understanding of what his job is, both in coaching, both in handling players, uh, working with administration, which is also in a better position, like you mentioned with Dondi and uh, Danny White. And then I think I think Heupel is continuing to grow in terms of public media relations. I think he's more comfortable than that uh, in that role than he was two years ago. So that would be an example of his him continuing to develop. He's still pretty pretty new into his uh, role as a head coach. This is year six for him, right? So uh, it's just if you compare those eras. It, it, when we talk about night and day, it's it's Earth to Mars. When we talk about Josh Heupel compared to Tennessee's previous head coaches, Josh Pruitt can at least be, scout a talent well. I will say that Pruitt did leave. Pruitt yeah. at least scouted talent talent well. Yeah, the, t- the 2019 talent. class was was well evaluated. It was just poorly uh, implemented. Right. If you take sure. the one skill out of all three of them, Pruitt's talent evaluation was the best of any. Skill. Besides quarterback, he he screwed up quarterback evaluating. No, I agree with that. But if you had to take one skill between the three of them, is that the best skill that all three possess? Pruitt's talent evaluation? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because he, he also – he knew the other guys that he had to go get, and some of them he just missed out on to the, the schools that Tennessee is competing against now. But, yeah, I think uh, across the board besides quarterback, Pruitt's ta- talent evaluation, not perfect, nobody is, but I think it was really good. Josh, can I still – did get Hendon Hooker, though, to be fair, with quarterback. Yeah, I mean, he he left some parting gifts, and I'm not kidding. Uh, Hooker was one. Byron Young coming in as a JUCO transfer that they found was really good, and a few others too. But yeah, Hooker and Byron Young were they were nice gifts that were left to the new coaching staff. Josh, great job on the column as always. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Tennessee does have some goals, so people can check that out on offthehooksports.com. There are goals out there other than just beating. Uh, Austin P. What are you smiling at, Josh, before I let you out? Of Rocky here? Top Tom says, no, the, the best quality was Jones was the best BSer. That's pretty good, too. <laughs> it's, a, it's a skill. Bring it on. Thanks Jones for was, cleaning that up, too. <laughs> Jones that? did. Butch did not understand. I will say this. One thing that every other coach, I think, understood that Butch didn't understand. He didn't realize that people covering him are not supposed to be mouthpieces for the program. That like I remember him saying in well, the meltdown there, with there the are, but. You're, you're correct. You are correct for sure. He is n- far from the only coach that thinks that, though. That's well, okay. he's, not the only, he's not the only Tennessee coach from the last 10 years that had that same opinion. Poor Josh has three kids under the age of five, and he's got a show to do. But i got to ask <laughs> one quick question. My yeah. favorite stupidity moment from that whole period was <laughs> the locker room door. I'm talking about the whole decade. Opportunity, <laughs> Dave. Where is it? It says opportunity, and it's supposed to be now and here, but they run the words together. I don't know if you can find a picture of that, uh, Caleb, but it's opportunity, and it reads like opportunity is nowhere. So you step yeah. into that locker room, and there is no opportunity anywhere to be found. Yeah, well, remember that that was also, I believe, the same season, but followed up by the Orange Dog. Remember the Orange Dog they brought out as a motivational piece? And that was this remember. is 2011, so this is just a uh, – a, a, an unforgettable time in Tennessee football history. Uh, I'll, I have a story to go with that as well. 2011, they have Vanderbilt in Kentucky to cl- <laughs> there it is to oh, close out the the regular season. They they're four and six. They need to go two and zero oh in the final two games. They beat Vanderbilt. Remember in the in the uh, overtime interception, and there's this big celebration. So I'm in the in the locker room post game or the media room, and I ask a player how big the win is. And he says, oh, it's huge. We're bowl eligible now. And I said, well, you got to beat Kentucky next week to be bowl eligible. And he was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, that's not a good sign for where the mindset is here. And they went out there and just played one of the most embarrassing games that Tennessee fans have ever watched with that loss against Kentucky with a wide receiver playing quarterback. So the, the orange dog gave him the inspiration for that one win, but he forgot to remind them they needed two wins. Yeah, yeah Tra- that's... Travis saying, I do wish Dave and Caleb wore an orange or shade of glasses. I, I will go ahead and say, Josh, uh, it didn't go this far. I think that Josh Heupel wins a national title at Tennessee. I, and that's, Josh, you know me. I wouldn't say that if I didn't believe it, would I? I mean, you've known me for, what, 20 years? Yeah, I mean, to um, 
to Travis's point, my understanding is that you pray every night before bed that they don't. So for you to make that kind of claim is <laughs> pray that they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, uh, that yeah, that's a that's a very bold claim because it's so difficult. But can it happen? Absolutely. I think Josh Heupel. Uh, I think Josh Heupel will have them in a position to have a legitimate shot at a title. It's so difficult, but they're going to be there's going to be a 12 team playoff. They're going to be in it a bunch with Josh Heupel, and they'll be one of those teams that can actually win it, not one of those teams that gets there and they're about to get beat down when they play one of the high-level teams. I think in the next two or three years, Tennessee will have a shot at a national title.